Please be seated. Uh, the sitting is open. La Cour se réunit ce matin et se réunira dans les prochains jours pour entendre des exposés oraux et observations au sujet de la demande d'avis consultatif que l'Assemblée générale de l'Organisation des Nations Unies lui a soumise sur la question des conséquences juridiques découlant des politiques et pratiques d'Israël dans le territoire palestinien occupé, y compris Jérusalem-Est. Je vais à présent rappeler les principales étapes de la présente procédure consultative. Le 30 décembre 2022, par sa résolution 77-247, l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies a décidé de demander un avis consultatif à la Cour. Le texte de cette résolution a été communiqué à la Cour par une lettre du secrétaire général de l'Organisation des Nations unies daté du 17 janvier 2023 et reçu au greffe le 19 janvier 2023. Je vais à présent demander au greffier de bien vouloir donner lecture du paragraphe de cette résolution contenant les questions sur lesquelles l'avis consultatif de la Cour est demandé. Question A. Quelles sont les conséquences juridiques de la violation persistante par Israël du droit du peuple palestinien à l'autodétermination de son occupation, de sa colonisation et de son annexion prolongée du territoire palestinien occupé depuis 1967, notamment des mesures visant à modifier la composition démographique, le caractère et le statut de la ville sainte de Jérusalem et de l'adoption par Israël des lois et mesures discriminatoires connexes Question B. Quelle incidence les politiques et pratiques d'Israël visées au paragraphe 18a ci-dessus ont-elles sur le statut juridique de l'occupation et quelles sont les conséquences juridiques qui en découlent pour tous les États et l'Organisation des Nations Unies Merci. Par ordonnance, en date du 3 février 2023, la Cour a décidé que l'Organisation des Nations Unies et ses États membres ainsi que l'État observateur de Palestine, était jugé susceptible de fournir des renseignements sur les questions qui lui étaient soumises pour avis consultatif et fixé au 25 juillet 2023 la date d'expiration du délai dans lequel des exposés écrits sur les questions pourraient lui être présentés et au 25 octobre 2023 la date d'expiration du délai dans lequel les États ou organisations qui auraient présenté un exposé écrit pourrait présenter des observations écrites sur les autres exposés. Statuant sur les demandes présentées ultérieurement par la Ligue des États arabes, l'Organisation de la coopération islamique et l'Union africaine, la Cour a décidé que ces trois organisations internationales étaient susceptibles de fournir des renseignements sur les questions dont la Cour est saisie et qu'en conséquence, elle pourrait le faire dans les délais fixés par la Cour. Au cours du mois de juin 2023, le secrétaire général de l'Organisation des Nations Unies a communiqué à la Cour un dossier de documents pouvant servir à élucider les questions formulées par l'Assemblée générale. Le dossier a été publié sur le site internet de la Cour. En complément du dossier, de nouveaux documents et plusieurs traductions ont été communiqués à la Cour par le secrétariat de l'Organisation des Nations Unies en octobre 2023. Written statements were filed in the registry in order of receipt by Turkey, Namibia, Luxembourg, Canada, Bangladesh, Jordan, Chile, Liechtenstein, Lebanon, Norway, Israel, Algeria, the League of Arab States, the Syrian Arab Republic, Palestine, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Egypt, Guyana, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Switzerland, Spain, the Russian Federation, Italy, Yemen, the Maldives, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, the African Union, Pakistan, South Africa, the United Kingdom, Hungary, Brazil, France, Kuwait, the United States of America, 
China, the Gambia, Ireland, Belize, Bolivia, Cuba, Mauritius, Morocco, Czechia, Malaysia, Colombia, Indonesia, Guatemala, Nauru, Djibouti, Togo, Fiji, Senegal, and Zambia. Then, written comments were filed in the registry in order of receipt by Jordan, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Qatar, Belize, Bangladesh, Palestine, the United States of America, Indonesia, Chile, the League of Arab States, Egypt, Algeria, Guatemala, Namibia, and Pakistan. By letters dated October 18, 2023, the Registrar informed the United Nations, its member states, and the Observer State of Palestine, as well as the League of Arab States, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and the African Union, that hearings on the request for an advisory opinion would open on 19 February 2024. For purposes of the current oral proceedings, the following participants set out in speaking order will take the floor. Palestine, South Africa, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Bangladesh, Belgium, Bra um, Belize, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Cuba, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, the United States of America, the Russian Federation, France, the Gambia, Guyana, Hungary, China, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Iraq, Ireland, Japan, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Luxembourg, Malaysia, Mauritius, Namibia, Norway, Oman, Pakistan, Indonesia, Qatar, the United Kingdom, Slovenia, Sudan, Switzerland, the Syrian Arab Republic, Tunisia, Turkey, Zambia, the League of Arab States, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the African Union, Spain, Fiji, the Maldives, and the Comoros. This morning, the Court will hear the State of Palestine, which has been allocated a maximum speaking time of three hours. All the other participants in the oral proceedings over the next days will speak for a maximum of 30 minutes each. Before inviting Palestine to address the court, I would add that in accordance with Article 106 of its rules, the court has decided that the written statements and written comments submitted in the current advisory proceedings to be made, are to be made accessible to the public after the opening of the present hearings. These written submissions will be posted on the court's website at the end of each day for those participating to the hearings on that day. The text of the oral statements will also be placed on the court's website. I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Riyad Maliki, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates of the State of Palestine. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, members of the court, it is an honor and a great responsibility to appear before you on behalf of the people and state of Palestine in these historic proceedings. I stand before you as 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza, half of them children, are besieged and bombed, killed and maimed, starved and displaced as more than 3.5 million Palestinians in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, are subjected to colonization of their territory and the racist violence that enables it. As 1.7 million Palestinians in Israel are treated as second-class citizens as unwelcomed intruders in their ancestral land. As 7 million Palestine refugees continue to be denied their right to return to their land and homes. I stand before you as the entire Palestinian people continue to be denied their fundamental rights, their very existence negated. For over a century, 
the inalienable right of the Palestinian people to self-determination has been denied and violated. Palestine was not a land without a people. It was not. As Israeli leaders have described it, a wasteland. There was life on this land. There was a political life, a cultural life, a social life, a religious life. It had schools and universities, cinemas and cultural halls. It had villages and villagers, families and communities whose life was disrupted by the impact of a promise made thousands of miles away over a hundred years ago. A breach of a sacred trust that relegated the indigenous people of the land to the status of non-Jewish communities, according them only civil and religious rights, denying their existence as a people and their rights as a nation, and paving the way for their dehumanization and mass expulsion from their homeland decades later. The United Nations enshrined in its charter the right of all peoples to self-determination and pledged to rid the world of the great, gravest breaches of this right, namely colonialism and apartheid. Yet, for decades, the Palestinian people have been denied this right and have endured both colonialism and apartheid. There are those who are outraged by the use of these words. They should instead be outraged by the reality we are living. This reality is known by every Palestinian, suffered by millions, generation after generation. It is a reality of the expulsion of the Palestinian people from their own land. Not just during the 1948 Nakba, which led to the expulsion of up to 900,000 Palestinians. Not just the expulsion of more than 400,000 Palestinians in 1967, but continually, including now, as I address you at this very moment, it is the indiscriminate maiming and killing of Palestinians. It means you can spend the entirety of your life as a refugee, denied your dignity and your right to return home. It means your life and family, your community and home are under constant threat. Your loved ones can be taken away and thrown in an Israeli jail, held there indefinitely. Your land can be stolen, colonized, and annexed without hesitation. Freedom is nowhere to be found. There is no safe haven. It means discrimination everywhere and no justice anywhere. It is a reality where Israel can destroy Gaza, killing tens of thousands of Palestinians, almost half of them children, leaving one million children starved, terrorized and traumatized for life, orphaned of a mother, a father or both, amputated and disabled, leaving nearly two million people displaced and desperate with nowhere to shelter from the onslaught. The genocide underway in Gaza is a result of decades of impunity and inaction. Ending Israel's impunity is a moral, political, and legal imperative. Successive Israeli governments have given the Palestinian people only three options. Displacement, subjugation, or death. These are the choices, ethnic cleansing, apartheid, or genocide. But our people are here to stay. They have a right to live in freedom and dignity in their ancestral land. They will not forsake their rights. I thus implore you, as you hear the legal arguments, not to forget the Palestinian people. 
Not to forget that our people are struggling every day for their survival as individuals, families, communities, as a nation. That less than a month ago, this court ordered provisional measures in a landmark case brought by the Republic of South Africa against Israel under the Genocide Convention, an order that Israel continues to defy with impunity. For decades, Israel has occupied the Palestinian territory, committing violations that are inherent to its presence in our land and colonial objective. This occupation is annexationist and supremacist in nature. It is a deliberate, cynical perversion of international law. It is thus illegal. The only solution consistent with international law is for this illegal occupation to come to an immediate, unconditional and total end. As you affirmed 20 years ago, the Palestinian people have the right to self-determination. It is an erga omnis right. It is non-negotiable, non-derogable. No occupying power, including Israel, can be granted a perpetual veto over the rights of the people it occupies. Allow me now to show you five maps. The first one is historic Palestine. This is the territory over which the Palestinian people should have been able to exercise their right to self-determination. Instead, the General Assembly recommended the partition of Palestine, ignoring the will of our people as shown in the second map. With the Nakba that ensued, over two-thirds of our people were systematically and forcibly expelled by Israel. And three-fourths of Palestine became Israel, as shown in the third map. This was the start of the Nakba, the disposition, the displacement and replacement of our people, the denial of rights and discrimination that continues to this very day. In 1967, Israel then occupied the remainder of Palestine, and from the first day of its occupation, started colonizing and annexing the land with the aim of making its occupation irreversible. It left us with a collection of disconnected Pantustans, preventing the independence of our state, as shown in Map 4. Israel wanted the, uh, the geography of Palestine, but not its demography. So it kept pushing our people out, out of their homes, out of their land. Here is the fifth map. It was displayed by Israel's Prime Minister to the General Assembly last September. He called this the new Middle East. This is no, there is no Palestine at all on this map. Only Israel, comprised of all the land from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. This shows you what the prolonged, continuous Israeli occupation of Palestine is intended to accomplish. The complete disappearance of Palestine and the destruction of the Palestinian people. There can be no justification for these in injustices and indignities. Allowing them to continue is unacceptable and inexcusable. Acquisition of territory by force Persecution, racial discrimination and apartheid against the people, denial of self-determination are all grave violations of the most fundamental norms of international law. There is a legal and moral obligation to bring them to a prompt end. Mr. President, members of the court, the State of Palestine reaffirms its unwavering commitment to the rule of international law which must finally prevail. The force of the law must prevail over the unlawful use of force. We said years ago that we made a choice, justice, not vengeance. But justice delayed is justice denied. And the Palestinian people have been denied justice for far 
too long. We believe in the universal principles crafted over decades to save successive generations from the scourge of war and oppression. It is time to put an end to the double standards that have kept our people captive for far too long. International law must be applied to all states without exception. No state can be absolved of its obligations under the law, and no people can be deprived of its protection. Palestine legitimate, legitimately seeks the fulfillment of the rights of our people, including the independence of the state of Palestine on the pre-1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital, in accordance with international law and the United Nations resolutions. This is the historical compromise we agreed to. A just and lasting solution with two democratic states, Palestine and Israel, living side by side in peace and security. We seek peace which can only be rooted in justice. When we committed to the peace process three de decades ago, we did it in the belief and expectation that international law would finally be upheld. Not that this process would witness its continued breach. We did so expecting that the rights of our people would finally be fulfilled, not further denied. By determining the law and the obligations of all states and organizations, this court can help chart a path for peace, anchored in justice and respecting international law. It has taken the Palestinian people decades of painful struggle to stand before you today. We appeal to the court to uphold our rights to self-determination, return and all other human rights, including by declaring that the Israeli occupation is illegal and must end immediately, totally and unconditionally. Mr. President, members of the court, I will be followed today by six speakers on behalf of the State of Palestine. First will be Professor Andreas Zimmermann, who will address the court's jurisdiction to answer the General Assembly's questions and the absence of compelling reasons that might lead the court to, decli to decline to do so. Next will be Mr. Paul Reichler, who will demonstrate the illegality of Israel's prolonged occupation because its annexation of Palestinian territory, including through widespread colonization, is intended to be permanent in violation of the prohibition of the acquisition of territory by force. The next speaker will be Ambassador Namira Negm, who will address the system of persecution racial discrimination and apartheid that Israel is imposing over the Palestinian people as a means of maintaining its control over the land by the subjugation of the indigenous Palestinian people. She will be followed by Professor Philip Sands, who will demonstrate how Israel's disposition, displacement and replacement of the Palestinian people and discrimination against them has led to the wholesale denial of their inalienable right to self-determination. The court will then be addressed by Professor Alain Pellet, who will identify the legal consequences that follow from Israel's grave and ongoing violations of peremptory norms. These legal consequences necessarily include the obligation to bring, to bring this unlawful occupation to an end and to dismantle the colonial and supremacist architecture, legal and physical, that Israel has consolidated over decades. The final speaker of the State of Palestine will be Minister Riyad Mansour, our permanent representative to the United Nations. Minister Mansour will focus on the permanent responsibility of the United Nations and the obligations of all states to bring this injustice to a swift end so as to uphold the laws, fulfill the Palestinian rights and achieve a just peace for all. Many states will also stand before this court informed 
by their own history of occupation, colonialism, and apartheid. They will stand here on principle to defend the international law-based order. And millions around the world will be watching, hoping that their faith in the international system can be restored and that the Palestinian people will not be abandoned or discarded as expendable. Palestine remains the greatest test of the, of the credibility of this international law-based order, a test humanity cannot afford to fail. Mr. President, members of the court, the state of Palestine expresses its fullest confidence that you will discharge the sacred duties entrusted to you with the wisdom, fairness, and justice that the world expects and needs of you. I thank you for the honor of addressing you, and I now request, Mr. President, the court to call on Professor Zimmerman. Thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Maliki for his opening statement. I now give the floor to Professor Andrea Zimmerman. You have the floor, Professor. Merci, Monsieur le Président, Mr. President, members of the court. Let me start by expressing my honor to appear once again before the court. This is even more true this time, since the current proceedings address issues that have been of utmost relevance for the international community for decades, and indeed for the United Nations since its very inception. These issues lie at the very heart of the organization's ability to achieve international peace and security, now more than ever. I will present Palestine's arguments on jurisdiction and admissibility. I can and will be succinct, as there is no doubt that the court has jurisdiction to give the requested opinion and that there are no compelling reasons for the court to decline to issue the requested opinion. Rather, to the contrary, compelling positive reasons exist for the court to address the legal questions referred to it, as the court's legal determinations will assist all parties as to the legal parameters that must be adhered to. The court's determinations are both urgent and relevant, given Israel's manifold violations of preemptory norms of international law, which continue and intensify on a daily basis. Mr. President, the court clearly has jurisdiction to provide the requested opinion. The General Assembly is obviously competent to request the opinion in line with Article 96.1 of the Charter. Moreover, Resolution 77-247 was adopted by a clear majority and in full compliance with both the requirements of the Charter and the Assembly's rules of procedure. The questions posed by the General Assembly are also plainly legal in character. And as the Court has repeatedly and consistently confirmed in its jurisprudence, the fact that the questions may have political implications is irrelevant and does not bar the Court from fulfilling its essential judicial function. Further, there is no reason, let alone a compelling one, for the Court to decline to issue the requested opinion. On the contrary, manifold reasons exist which confirm that an answer by the Court to these questions is of utmost importance for the General Assembly, the United Nations at large, and the international community as a whole. First, the questions concern serious breaches of Jus Kogans and Erga Omnis norms. As my colleagues will show, those breaches by Israel include violations of the prohibition of acquisition of territory by force, the prohibition of racial discrimination and apartheid, the denial of the right of self-determination, as well as other egregious violations of international human rights and humanitarian law of the same character. Accordingly, all states, as well as the United Nations in total, have a legally protected interest in having those violations in both their individual and cumulative manifestations, as well as their legal consequences laid out and clarified by the court so as to guide them in their future actions. Second, the questions concern the United Nations' continuous responsibility 
for resolving the question of Palestine. This responsibility stems from its duties relating to matters of international peace and security arising under the Charter and, as the Court put it, quote, has its origin in the mandate and the partition resolution concerning Palestine, end quote. This responsibility continues as confirmed by the unequivocal and contemporary practice of the General Assembly, the Security Council, as well as other United Nations organs and bodies. And as the Court had previously reiterated in its wall advisory opinion, there exists, and I quote, a permanent responsibility of the United Nations towards the question of Palestine until the question is resolved in all its aspects in a satisfactory manner in accordance with international legitimacy, end quote. The questions put before the court by the Assembly thus seek the court's legal guidance on matters of fundamental and long-standing importance and concern to the United Nations. Third, all of the grounds for declining to issue an opinion suggested in the submissions of a few states fall far short of constituting compelling reasons that must exist for the court to refrain from answering the General Assembly's questions. Some of these submissions oppose the advisory opinion because of the purported existence of a negotiation framework or of bilateral negotiations. However, none of these considerations constitutes a reasonable basis for the court to refuse the General Assembly's request. To the contrary, an opinion from the court will assist in these negotiations by confirming the applicable international legal framework as affirmed in United Nations resolutions in order to reach a just and peaceful solution. As a matter of fact, there exist, uh, there exist at least three reasons why the court should not be deterred from answering the GA's questions on that basis. First, Israel has repeatedly refused, and to this very day, to engage in meaningful negotiations with Palestine on the basis of international law and United Nations resolutions. This is reflected in repeated statements, including most recently by the Israeli Prime Minister and other high-ranking Israeli officials. The mere hypothetical possibility of future negotiations cannot thus be used as a mere pre pretext for avoiding the application of international law to this crucial matter, or for avoiding responsibility for ongoing breaches of preemptory norms of international law. Israel, Israel has made it clear that it wants and will tolerate only one state, Israel, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. This is confirmed inter alia by the map displayed by the Israeli Prime Minister in his speech before the General Assembly of 22 September 2023 that you have already seen, as well as by his November 2023 statement where the Israeli Prime Minister said that he was proud to have prevented the establishment of a Palestinian state. But these statements of Israel's head of government have not been empty words. Rather, they are reflected in concrete policy decisions and measures on the ground undertaken by Israel for decades. Inter alia, when faced with the attempt by Palestine to initiate the conciliation procedure under Articles 11 and 12 third, it was Israel that consistently and continuously rejected any meaningful attempt to bring to an end by way of negotiations under the auspices of the Ad Hoc Commission set up under Article 12 third, its entrenched system of racial discrimination inherent in its occupation regime. Second, and significantly, the Security Council has repeatedly called for a peaceful settlement of the question of Palestine based on international law, based on international law. It renewed this call only two months ago in December 2023 in its resolution 2720 when reiterating that the solution to the conflict must be, and I quote the Council, consistent with international law and relevant UN resolutions, end quote. The Court's opinion can thus only contribute to achieving the peaceful settlement of the question of Palestine called for by the Security Council. 
it, your opinion, will clarify the legal rights and obligations of Israel, of Palestine, of third states and of the United Nations to be reflected in a settlement that is truly consistent with international law. Thus, the Court's opinion will also contribute to upholding the international rule of law at large. In that regard, let me remind you, members of the Court, that this is precisely what the Court's advisory opinion in the Chagos proceedings achieved. By clarifying the, legal, the relevant legal rules, it your opinion broke the deadlock that had precluded negotiations. The advisory opinion, your opinion, led the United Kingdom to agree to negotiate with Mauritius for the first time on the basis of Mauritius' sovereignty over the disputed territory. Third, the General Assembly, when deciding upon the request for the current advisory opinion, was acutely aware of the claim that such request would somehow purportedly undermine the chances of future negotiations. Nevertheless, the General Assembly decided to ask for the Court's legal determination anyway. The General Assembly thus found that this argument had no merit. To the contrary, it considered, the GA considered, that the Court's opinion would be helpful as to future steps to be taken by the political organs of the United Nations, as well as by all states. In line with your role as one of the principal organs of the organization, as envisaged in Article 7 of the Charter, the Court ought not now set aside this considered decision of the General Assembly. Members of the Court, the mere hypothetical chance of possible future negotiations cannot and ought not prevent the court from rendering its opinion. If this were the case, quod non, a reluctant state wishing to bar the court from exercising its judicial function could unilaterally, unilaterally prevent the matter from reaching the court by simply insisting on the mere possibility of negotiations. This would curtail the General Assembly's right to receive legal assistance from the court and to do so even in a situation where the General Assembly, making the request, determined that such opinion by the court would be needed for the exercise of its own function. Such approach finds no basis in the wording of the Charter or the court statute either. It would unduly limit the right of the political organs of the United Nations to request an opinion from the court on any as the wording has it, on any legal question, as both 96.1 Charter and 65 of the Court Statute provide unequivocally. Mr. President, members of the Court, let me conclude. The catastrophic developments of recent months in the Gaza Strip confirm that the matters put to the Court by the General Assembly are, if ever there was need, not mere bilateral issues. Rather, they are issues of grave consequence for the maintenance of international peace and security. They are thus of immense concern for the international community at large, where the court's legal guidance is desperately needed. All of these aforementioned considerations corroborate that in the present proceedings, as indeed in each and every previous advisory proceedings that had come before this court, there are no reasons no compelling reasons to prevent the court from rendering its opinion. Rather, Palestine invites the court to fulfill its duty of providing its legal determination to the General Assembly by answering the legal questions put to it. In so doing, you will assist all states as well as the United Nations in furthering respect for the international rule of law, the fulfillment of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, and a just and peaceful solution in accordance with international law. Members of the court, I thank you for your kind attention and would now kindly ask you, Mr. President, to call upon Mr. Reichler to take the floor. Thank you. I thank Professor Zimmermann. I now give the floor to Mr. Paul Reichler. You have the floor, Mr. Reichler. Mr. President, members of the court, it is an honor for me to appear before you and a privilege to speak on behalf of the State of Palestine. 
I will address the legality of Israel's prolonged occupation, annexation, and settlement of the occupied Palestinian territory. In so doing, I will identify the elements that determine whether and in what circumstances a belligerent occupation is or becomes unlawful under international law. I will then review the evidence to assess whether those elements are present here. And I will show that based on the applicable law and the well-established and undisputed facts, Israel's 56-year occupation of Palestinian territory is manifestly and gravely unlawful and that international law requires that it be brought to an end completely and unconditionally. The applicable rule of law is straightforward. As Pictet wrote in 1958, occupation is essentially a temporary situation. This remains the law. In December 2022, the General Assembly, in Resolution 77-126, recognized that the occupation of a territory is to be a temporary de facto situation, whereby the occupying power can neither claim possession nor exert its sovereignty over the territory it occupies. This rule is neatly explained in the written statement of Switzerland. The laws of occupation are built on the idea that occupation is only a temporary situation. They are based on four fundamental principles. One, the occupying power does not acquire sovereignty over the territory it occupies. Two, the occupying power must maintain the status quo ante and must not take any measures which might bring about permanent changes. The law is thus crystal clear. Occupation can only be a temporary state of affairs. A permanent occupation is a legal oxymoron. Mr. President, what makes Israel's ongoing occupation of the Palestinian territory unlawful is precisely its permanent character. And what demonstrates its permanence are, one, Israel's de jure and de facto annexation of Jerusalem and the West Bank. Two, its claims of sovereignty over these areas which it refers to by their biblical names, Judea and Samaria, and considers integral parts of the state of Israel. Three, its establishment of hundreds of permanent Israeli settlements, with over 700,000 Israeli settlers who have been promised by successive Israeli governments that they will never be removed. And four, the multitude of official statements and documents that openly declare Israel's intention to incorporate all of the occupied territory east of the Green Line into the state of Israel as a permanent part of a single Jewish state extending from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. As I will show you, the evidence is overwhelming and leaves no room for serious dispute about Israel's actions or its intentions. As Israel's cabinet secretary wrote in June of last year, quote, Judea and Samaria were not seized from a sovereign state recognized by international law, and the state of Israel has a right to impose its sovereignty over these areas as they comprise the cradle of history of the Jewish people and are an inseparable part of the land of Israel. 
as purported legal authority, the cabinet secretary invoked the first book of Maccabees, written in the year 100 BC, chapter 15, verse 33. It is not a foreign land we have taken, nor have we seized the property of foreigners, but only our ancestral heritage, which for a time had been unjustly occupied by our enemies. This was followed in August of last year by a message broadcast on Israel Army Radio by Israel's heritage minister. Sovereignty, sovereignty must be extended within the borders of the West Bank. And the most prudent way to create international recognition that this place is ours. There is no green line. It is a fictitious line that creates a distorted reality and must be erased. In September 2023, Israel's Prime Minister literally erased the green line in his presentation to the United Nations General Assembly. As you saw earlier, he depicted the State of Israel as extending from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, eliminating not only the Green Line, but all traces of Palestine. This was no oversight. It was an act of the head of government with the, all the attribution that it implies. The same message was delivered by Israel's finance minister in Paris six months earlier when he denied the existence of Palestine and declared that Palestinians do not constitute a people. Previously, he said, quote, we are here to stay. We will make it clear that our national ambition for a Jewish state from the river to the sea is an accomplished fact, a fact not open to discussion or negotiation. This has been Israel's consistent position. Here is the map of Israel produced by its armed forces and published by the government in 2021. One state, Israel, from the river to the sea. There is no green line. There is no Palestine. Instead, Palestine has been replaced by Judea and Samaria, which according to Israel's highest officials, are now integral parts of the state of Israel. As these official statements and maps demonstrate, Israel makes no secret of its intention to retain permanently the entire area east of the Green Line. Its annexation of occupied Palestinian territory began in 1967 with legislation annexing East Jerusalem, which Israel increased 11-fold in size to incorporate not only the holy city, but also vast areas of the West Bank surrounding the city. Its defense minister, Moshe Dayan, declared at the time, the Israel Defense Forces have liberated Jerusalem. We have returned to this most sacred shrine, never to part from it again. In 1990, the Israeli cabinet instructed the foreign minister to notify the Secretary General of the United Nations that Jerusalem is not in any part occupied territory. It is the sovereign capital of Israel. In June 1996, the guidelines of the incoming Israeli government stated, Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, is one city, whole and undivided, and will remain forever under Israel's sovereignty. More recently, in assuming office in December 2022, the current prime minister declared, that the Jewish people are not occupiers in their own land, nor occupiers in our eternal capital, Jerusalem. As these official statements make clear, Israel's dominion over Jerusalem and the incorporated area of the West Bank is not intended to be temporary. It has been repeatedly proclaimed by Israel's highest authorities to be eternal. In furtherance of this end, more than 230,000 Israeli Jewish settlers encouraged, subsidized, and protected by the Israeli government and occupation forces have been installed in East Jerusalem, dramatically altering the demographic composition of the holy city.
by creating an Israeli Jewish majority. Israel has been equally clear in declaring its permanence in the West Bank, where more than 465,000 Israeli Jewish settlers have been implanted, with the support of every Israeli government since 1967. In over 270 ever-expanding settlements spread throughout this territory in what can only be described as a vast colonial enterprise. These settlements, whose accelerated growth and distribution over the years are illustrated on your screens now, are a key instrument of Israel's annexation of the West Bank. This is both their purpose and their effect. As the Secretary General reported to the General Assembly in 2015, occupation is supposed to be temporary because the annexation or acquisition of territory by force is strictly prohibited under international law. In the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the establishment and maintenance of the settlements amount to a slow but steady annexation of the occupied Palestinian territory. Israel has made no secret of the intended permanence of these settlements. In 2010, Prime Minister Netanyahu told Israeli settlers in the West Bank, our message is clear, we are planting here, we will stay here, we will build here. This place will be an inseparable part of the state of Israel for eternity. In August 2019, the Prime Minister announced, the time has come to apply Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley and to also arrange the status of all Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. They will be part of the state of Israel. In January 2020, Israel's defense minister, Naftali Bennett, declared, our objective is that within a short amount of time, we will apply sovereignty to all of Area C, not just the settlements, not just this block or another. This area, which is depicted in red on your screens now, comprises over 61% of the West Bank. The defense minister proclaimed, I solemnly declare that Area C belongs to Israel. This area includes the Jordan Valley, which is the water reservoir, the breadbasket, and the source of life for the entire West Bank. In December 2022, the guiding principles of the incoming Israeli government declared, the Jewish people have an exclusive and indisputable right to all parts of the land of Israel. The government will promote and development the settlement of all parts of the land of Israel, the Galilee, the Negev, the Golan, and Judea and Samaria. The coalition agreement between the political parties that, performed the, that formed the government included this pledge. The Prime Minister will lead the formulation and promotion of policy in which sovereignty will be applied in Judea and Samaria while choosing the timing and weighing all the national and international interests of the State of Israel. General Assembly Resolution 77-126 was adopted on 12 December 2022, just as the current Israeli government was assuming office. The resolution pointedly recalled, quote, the principle of the inadmissibility of the acquisition of land by force, and therefore the illegality of the annexation of any part of the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, which constitutes a breach of international law. And the resolution condemned, quote, the Israel's annexation of land, whether de facto or through national legislation. Israel has thoroughly disregarded Resolution 77-126, just as it disregarded 
all prior General Assembly and Security Council resolutions declaring illegal the annexation of any part of the occupied Palestinian territory and the establishment of Israeli settlements there. These include, but are by no means limited to, Security Council Resolution 252 of 1968, declaring Israel's acquisition of territory by military conquest inadmissible. Resolution 476 of 1980, which reaffirmed the overriding necessity for ending the prolonged occupation of Arab territories in 1980, and strongly deplored the refusal of Israel to comply with the relevant resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly. Resolution 478 of 1980, which determined that all legislative and administrative measures and actions taken by Israel to alter the character and status of the holy city of Jerusalem, and particularly the basic law in Jerusalem, are null and void and must be rescinded forthwith. Resolution 2334 of 2016, which reaffirmed the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force and condemned all measures aimed at altering the demographic composition, character, and status of the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967, including inter alia, the construction and expansion of settlements, transfer of Israeli settlers, confiscation of land, demolition of homes, and displacement of Palestinian submissions. And at least 28 General Assembly resolutions which expressly condemned Israel's annexation of Jerusalem and the West Bank. Israel has also blatantly disregarded the obligations reflected in the court's 2004 advisory opinion in the Wall case. Since then, instead of dismantling the wall, Israel has extended it from a length of 190 kilometers to more than 460 kilometers, encompassing hundreds of additional square kilometers of Palestinian land and incorporating it into the state of Israel. In its advisory opinion, the court expressed concern lest, quote, the construction of the wall and its associated regime create a fait accompli on the ground that could well become permanent, in which case, and notwithstanding the formal characterization of the wall by Israel, it would be tantamount to de facto annexation. And that is precisely what has happened over the past 20 years, not only within the expanded confines of the wall, but all across the West Bank, most of which has now been annexed de facto by Israel. In 2022, the report of the United Nations International Commission of Inquiry concluded, Israel treats the occupation as a permanent fixture and has for all intents and purposes annexed parts of the West Bank. The International Court of Justice anticipated such a scenario in its 2004 advisory opinion. This has now become the reality. The Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territory reached the same conclusion. The occupation by Israel has been conducted in profound defiance of international law. Its 55-year-old occupation burst through the restraints of temporariness long ago. Israel has progressively engaged in the de jure and de facto annexation of occupied territory. Mr. President, Israel's ongoing annexation of the West Bank accelerated in 2023 with the largest ever expansion of settlements in the territory. 22 new settlements were authorized and more than 16,000 new housing units were built, funded, or planned by Israeli authorities. As explained by Israel's finance minister, quote, the construction boom in Judea and Samaria and all over our country continues. We will continue to develop the settlements and strengthen the Israeli hold on the territory. 
In developing its settlements, Israel has invested heavily in the infrastructure needed to supply them with water and electric power, as well as a network of roads and highways connect, to connect them to one another and to Israel itself. These investments in the hundreds of millions of dollars attest to the intended permanent character of the settlements. The roads which Palestinians are forbidden to use and a pervasive system of roadblocks and checkpoints prevent Palestinians, but not Israeli settlers, from moving from place to place in the West Bank. And they isolate Palestinian communities by cutting them off from one another. Israel's settlement expansion has thus both uprooted Palestinians from their homes to make room for new settlements and forced them to live in disconnected and non-contiguous enclaves which the special rapporteur has called, quote, a fragmented archipelago of 165 disparate patches of land. This achieves the fundamental objective of the occupation, permanent acquisition of the maximum amount of Palestinian territory with the minimum number of Palestinians in it. In furtherance of this objective, and with increasing frequency, armed groups of settlers supported by Israel's occupation forces and encouraged by government ministers have violently expelled thousands of peaceful Palestinian civilians from their ancestral villages and lands. A UN fact-finding mission confirmed, quote, the motivation behind this violence and the intimidation against the Palestinians and their properties is to drive the local populations away from their lands and allow the settlements to expand. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights reported in March 2023, quote, settler violence further intensified, reaching the highest levels ever recorded by the United Nations. In November 2023, the High Commissioner warned that the situation had further deteriorated with, quote, a sharp increase in settler violence and takeover of land across the West Bank. Since 7 October, he continued, nearly 1,000 Palestinians from at least 15 herding communities have been forced from their homes. The Secretary General, in his most recent report, issued on 25 October 2023, expressly linked the expansion of Israeli settlements to the permanent acquisition of Palestinian territory. Successive Israeli governments have consistently advanced and implemented policies of settlement expansion and takeover of Palestinian land. The policies of the current government in this regard are aligned to an unprecedented extent with the goals of the Israeli settler movement to expand long-term control over the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and in practice to further integrate those areas within the territory of the State of Israel. Mr. President, members of the Court, taking account of this evidence as well as that described in the State of Palestine's two written submissions, I turn to the law and how it applies to this occupation. The written statement of Switzerland is once again directly on point. It highlights the distinction between the law of occupation and the legality of a particular occupation. The law of occupation and the legality of occupation are two different questions. The law of occupation applies independently of the question of the legality of the occupation. Occupation is a situation subject to international humanitarian law, whereas its legality is covered by the United Nations Charter. In relation to the legality of the occupation, under the Charter, Switzerland observes, quote, the United Nations has consistently reaffirmed the principle of the inadmissibility 
of the acquisition of territory by force and condemned Israeli measures aimed at modifying the demographic composition, the character and the status of Jerusalem and the occupied Palestinian territory as a whole. Notably, the construction and extension of settlements, the transfer of Israeli settlements, the confiscation of land, the demolition of homes, and the displacement of Palestinian civilians. In Switzerland's view, quote, the measures taken by Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory lead to fundamental changes, particularly demographic changes, that can have a permanent character. In such circumstances, Switzerland expressly invites the court, quote, to rule on the consequences of the permanent character of the measures taken by Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory as to the status of the occupation under general international law, in particular, the Charter of the United Nations. Many states agree with this approach. France, too, underscores the temporary character of lawful occupation. This is a requirement that Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory plainly fails to meet. As France states, if the restrictions authorized by a regime of occupation were justifiable in the period following the military operations, they are not anymore today. These points have been reiterated by the Security Council and the General Assembly on numerous occasions concerning Israel's obligation to withdraw from the occupied territories. France calls out, in particular, Israel's annexation of occupied territory. Quote, the status of occupying power does not confer any legal title justifying annexation. The passage of time is not sufficient as regards the acquisition of territory by force to render lawful a situation that is gravely unlawful. On Israel's vast network of settlements and hundreds of thousands of settlers in the occupied territory, France states, these permanent establishments are obviously incompatible with the necessarily temporary character of the occupation. 35 of the states and international organizations that submitted written statements addressed to the legality of Israel's occupation, uh, 35 of, 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 of the states and international organizations have addressed the legality of Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory. Only two of these 35, to which I will come, argued that the occupation is not unlawful. Key excerpts reflecting the views expressed by the overwhelming majority that the occupation is unlawful as a whole and must be brought to an end are collected in Chapter 2 of the State of Palestine's written comments. Here are three brief but emblematic examples. The African Union, quote, invites the court to conclude that the prolonged Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories is in itself unlawful. The policies and practices associated with it amount to de facto and de jure annexation of the Palestinian territories, which violates the prohibition on the acquisition of territory by force. Brazil observes that, quote, occupation is inherently temporary. This is the basic distinction between occupation and annexation. Brazil here hits the nail right on the head. Unlike occupation, annexation is intended to be permanent, and it makes the occupation itself unlawful. In Brazil's words, Israel's policies and practices render the occupation unlawful as a whole inasmuch as it would be tantamount to the acquisition of territory by force. Japan, too, emphasizes that the annexation of occupied territory is unlawful, referring to Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. Quote, as the ICJ clarified in the Wall Advisory Opinion, 
the illegality of the acquisition of territory by force is a corollary of the prohibition of use of force incorporated in the UN Charter, which Japan calls, quote, the most fundamental rule of the post-war regime for peace based on the rule of law among nations. The two outliers are Fiji and the United States. Of all the states that submitted written statements to the court, only Fiji attempted to defend the occupation as lawful. But even Fiji conceded that Israel has annexed East Jerusalem de jure, and that the application of an occupying power's laws to the occupied territory, which is the case in the West Bank, constitutes an annexation de facto. Nor did Israel itself deny its annexations of Jerusalem and the West Bank. Its abbreviated written statement is mainly an attack on the General Assembly for its alleged bias. It makes no attempt to defend the legality of its occupation under international law. The only state besides Fiji to defend Israel is the United States. This is not surprising. Whatever offenses against international law Israel commits, the United States comes forward to shield it from accountability. Here, the United States att attempts to defend Israel not by arguing that the occupation is lawful, but that it is neither lawful nor unlawful. To reach this conclusion, the United States argues that belligerent occupation is governed exclusively by international humanitarian law and not by the UN Charter or general international law. In its own words, quote, Although international humanitarian law imposes obligations on belligerents in their conduct of an occupation, it does not provide for the legal status of an occupation to be lawful or unlawful. Even assuming arguendo that this is a correct reading of international humanitarian law, which we dispute, it does not lead to the conclusion that an occupation cannot be unlawful under international law. What about Article 2.4 of the UN Charter and general international law, including the prohibition on acquisition of territory by force? For the United States, apparently, this peremptory norm does not exist when it comes to Israel's annexation and settlement of the occupied Palestinian territory. Only in such a lawless and UN charterless world could the Israeli occupation be described as not unlawful. Notably, the United States ignores the part of the General Assembly's request that the court determine the legal status of the occupation under the UN Charter, in addition to IHL and other sources of law. And the US fails to mention, let alone respond to Switzerland's written statement, asserting that belligerent occupation is covered both by IHL and by the UN Charter and general international law, and that the legality of the occupation itself is governed by the latter. The United States also ignores the written statements of the many other states, which conclude that the Israeli occupation is unlawful as a whole, precisely because its annexation and settlement of the occupied territory constitutes a permanent acquisition of territory by force in violation of Article 2.4 and general international law. Instead, in a single footnote, the United States responds only to those states which submitted that the Israeli occupation is unlawful under Articles 40 and 41 of the draft Articles on State Responsibility for Internationally Wrongful Conduct. Remarkably, the U.S. contends that neither of those two articles reflect general international law. This is truly stunning. A persistent failure of a state to fulfill an obligation arising under a peremptory norm is not unlawful under general international law as provided in Article 40. 
the injunction in Article 41 that no state shall recognize as lawful a situation created by a serious breach of a peremptory norm is not part of general international law? Just how far in disregarding the international legal order will the United States go to exempt Israel from the consequences of its ongoing violation of peremptory norms, including the prohibition on acquisition of territory by force. Apparently, very far indeed. According to former U.S. President Barack Obama, in the memoir he published in 2020, just about every country in the world considered Israel's continued occupation of the Palestinian territories to be a violation of international law. As a result, our diplomats found themselves in the awkward position of having to defend Israel for actions that we ourselves opposed. This is exactly what the United States is doing, again, in these proceedings. Mr. President, members of the court, the evidence is before you. In the written submissions of the State of Palestine, and dozens of other states and international organizations, and in the voluminous materials supplied to you by the Secretary General, and it is indisputable. Under the umbrella of its prolonged military occupation, Israel has been steadily annexing the occupied Palestinian territory, and it continues to do so. Its undisguised objective is the permanent acquisition of this territory and the exercise of sovereignty over it in defiance of the prohibition on acquisition of territory by force. The evidence is not only indisputable, it is of the highest probative value. Investigative reports of authoritative United Nations agencies, reports of the Secretary General, resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly, legislative and administrative acts by the Israeli government, and public statements against interest by the most senior government officials, admitting that Israel's objective is sovereignty over all the territory east of the Green Line and its incorporation into a single Jewish state from the river to the sea. In this case, there is no reason not to take them at their word because their deeds have been entirely consistent with it. For Israel, as its successive governments have made clear, there is no Palestine. It simply does not exist. In November 2023, Prime Minister Netanyahu declared that his government would never agree to a Palestinian state in the occupied territory. He later declared, I will not compromise on full security control over all the territory west of Jordan, and this is contrary to a Palestinian state. Israel's intransigence was confirmed by its staunchest ally in December 2023, when U.S. President Joe Biden publicly lamented that Israel's leaders, quote, don't want anything remotely approaching a two-state solution. That is the very solution demanded by the Security Council, the General Assembly, the overwhelming majority of states and the state of Palestine itself. It is, in fact, the only solution that can lead to lasting peace and security for the Israeli people as well as the Palestinian people. And it is this very solution that has been frustrated by Israel's defiant insistence on maintaining its dominion over Palestinian territory in perpetuity. This is why the court's advisory opinion is so critical and so urgent. The best and possibly the last hope for the two-state solution that is so vital to the needs of both peoples is for the court 
to declare illegal the main obstacle to that solution, the ongoing Israeli occupation of Palestine, and for it to pronounce in the clearest possible terms that international law requires that this entire illegal enterprise be terminated completely, unconditionally, and immediately. Mr. President, the law is clear and it demands nothing less. A permanent occupation, one that is founded upon annexation and massive settlement of the occupied territory and which aims to exercise sovereignty over it is manifestly and gravely unlawful. It is an ongoing international wrong that must be brought to an immediate end. As the court ruled in 1971, quote, the continued presence of South Africa in Namibia being illegal, South Africa is under obligation to withdraw its administration from Namibia immediately and thus put an end to its occupation of the territory. The Secretary General applied this principle directly to Palestine in his remarks to the Security Council one month ago. Quote, Palestinians must see their legitimate aspirations for a fully independent, viable, and sovereign state realized in line with United Nations resolutions, international law, and previous agreements. Israel's occupation must end. End of quote. Mr. President, the proverbial ball is now in your court. The General Assembly has asked you the critical questions. It is now your responsibility to answer them. Silence is not an option. As the immortal Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish wrote, in silence we become accomplices. But, he assured us, when we speak, every word has the power to change the world. Mr. President, members of the court, your words have such power. In 2004, the court affirmed the inalienable right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. In 2024, it is time for you to enable them, finally, to exercise that right by freeing them from the unlawful Israeli occupation of their territory so that they may live in a sovereign and fully independent state of their own, in peaceful and secure coexistence with all their neighbors, including Israel. By upholding international law, which is all the state of Palestine asks you to do, your powerful words will change the world. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the court, for your kind courtesy and patient attention. Um, we're in your hands, Mr. President, whether you would like to take uh, the mid-morning break now or call our next speaker. I thank Mr. Reichler. I invite the next speaker to take the floor after a coffee break of 10 minutes. The uh, sitting is suspended. Please be seated. Uh, the sitting is resumed. I shall give the floor now to Ms. Namira Nagam. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it's an honor to appear before you on behalf of the State of Palestine to address Israel's racial discrimination, persecution, and apartheid against the Palestinian people. Starting from the Nakba of 1948 until now, Israel has adopted discriminatory legislation and measures by which it has established a deeply entrenched system of racial discrimination against Palestinians, subjugating them to Israeli domination and denying their fundamental rights. 
Discrimination against the Palestinian people is as integral to Israel's prolonged occupation as is the annexation and colonization of the Palestinian territory. They are inextricable parts of the same whole and feed of each other. The UN Special Rapporteur has explained, and I quote, at the heart of this settler colonial project of Israel is a comprehensive dual legal and political system that provides comprehensive rights and living conditions for the Jewish Israeli settlers in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, while imposing upon the Palestinians military rule and control without any of the basic protections of international humanitarian and human rights law, end of quote. In the OPT, Israeli civilian laws apply extraterritorially to illegal settlers, while draconian Israeli military laws apply to the Palestinian population on the sole basis of nation, nation, national or ethnic origin. Using a toolbox of population control and inhumane acts amounting to aggravated forms of racial discrimination, Israel restricts every aspect of Palestinians' life, from birth to death, resulting in manifest human rights violations and an overt system of repression and persecution. Treated as a burden and a demographic threat, Palestinians' rights to life, liberty, and their fundamental freedoms are systematically denied in East Jerusalem, by revoking thousands of residential permits, Israel has transformed the Palestinians with deep ancestral roots into temporary residents who can lose that residency and the right to live in their city at any moment. Through indiscriminate killing, summary execution, mass arbitrary arrest, torture, forced displacement, settler violence, movement restrictions and blockades. Israel subjects Palestinians to inhumane life conditions and untold human indignities, affecting the fate of every man, woman, and child under its control. For Israel, Palestinians are by definition guilty. Hence, it comes as a no surprise that the conviction rate for Palestinians hold before Israeli military courts stands at 99%. In the words of the special rapporteur, and I quote, Israel's all-encompassing criminalization shows that the military legislation, rather than safeguarding security, renders every single Palestinian potentially subject to imprisonment for ordinary acts of life, end of quote. By contrast, despite the call by the Security Council for Israel to disarm the settlers, their violence continues, aided and abetted by the Israeli government and military. This is part and parcel of this Israeli domination and discrimination enterprise. Settlers are rarely, if ever, prosecuted for crimes against Palestinians, ravaging them with absolute impunity. Even some states friendly to Israel have now decided to sanction some of the violent settlers themselves, as Israel fails to do so. Palestinians and Palestinians only endure horrific levels of extensive human and material losses, including home demolitions, enforced as collective punishment. All of this has created a coercive environment that facilitates Israel's forcible displacement of Palestinians. As described by the special rapporteur, and I quote, collective punishment is an inflamed scar that runs across the entire Israeli occupation of Palestine. Notwithstanding, numerous resolutions, reports, and reminders critical of its use 
Israel continues to rely upon collective punishment as a prominent instrument in its coercive toolbox of population control. The logic of collective punishment has been to project domination in order to subdue a subjugated population through inflicting a steep price for its resistance to alien rule. In Gaza, this collective punishment has reached unbearable levels. Hermetically sealed from the outside world by 17-year air, land and sea blockade with no end in sight. The situation in Gaza was described as early as 2016 by the Secretary General as collective punishment for which there must be accountability. In the absence of accountability, Gaza is besieged and bombed. Massacres perpetrated for more than 140 days now and nearly the entire population forcibly displaced and at risk of perishing. Mr. President, this prolonged repressive regime has dehumanized Palestinians, denying them the right to life, the right to safety, the right to even exist while confining and fragmenting them and their territory. The court is not facing isolated or individual acts violating Palestinian human rights, but rather the cumulative effect of systematic policies undoubtedly constituting a pattern of racial discrimination. Members of the court, the policies and practice of Israel amount to segregation with the existence in the occupied Palestinian territory of two entirely separate legal systems. These are not my words. These are the words of the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, tasked by more than 180 states to fight the scourge of racial discrimination. Likewise, the UN International Commission of Inquiry has described the situation in the OPT as legal regime of segregation. When it comes to determining that a measure policy or practice disproportionately affects a group, this court attributes considerable weight to reports of several UN organs and monitoring bodies and to the constant practice of independent treaty bodies. The findings of independent treaty bodies are a fortiori to be ascribed great weight when their findings are shared by the UN General Assembly, the Human Rights Council, special rapporteurs, as well as by almost all the participants in the present proceedings. Members of the court, Israel's occupation has been replete with systematic exclusions and restrictions adopted with the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment or exercise on an equal footing of human rights. As noted by the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, and I quote, the political system of entrenched rule in the occupied Palestinian territory that endows one racial, national, ethnic group with substantial rights, benefits, and privileges while intentionally subjugating another group to live behind walls and checkpoints and under a permanent military rule. Sans droit, sans égalité, sans dignité, et sans liberté, satisfies the prevailing evidentiary standard for the existence of apartheid. Apartheid exists in the occupied Palestinian territory. 20 participant states expressly hold the same position, including victims of apartheid, South Africa and Namibia. As all states parties to the third, Israel, is under obligation to particularly condemn racial segregation and apartheid, undoubtedly apartheid falls within the scope 
of discriminatory measures referred to in the UNGA resolution requesting this advisory opinion. This court, as early as 1971 in its Namibia opinion, also confirmed that apartheid amounts to a flagrant violation of the purposes and principles of the Charter. Further, the ILC has listed the prohibition of apartheid as a preemptory norm, permitting no derogation. Applying the definition of apartheid, which reflects customary law, in both the 1973 Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid and the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, Israel's policies and practices in the OPT meet the evidentiary standards for the existence of apartheid. First, the existence of two, more, two or more different racial groups is present. International law determines racial groups by the subjective perception of the group that it has a separate identity. Judged by the standard, two distinct separate racial groups coexist in Palestine, namely the indigenous Palestinian population and Israeli Jews. Second, the establishment of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over another undoubtedly exists. As evidenced in the State of Palestine's written statement, Israel has in purpose and in effect elaborated through laws, military courts, violence, discriminatory zoning and planning and collective punishment the system to subjugate Palestinians. They are confined in space and rights. They travel on segregated roads, a phenomena that even apartheid South Africa never knew. Third, the commission of inhumane acts is endemic. Israel subjects the Palestinians at unprecedented levels to inhumane acts as defined by these two conventions. Such inhumane acts include murder, forcible population transfer, massive arbitrary arrest, imprisonment, and torture. And while the occupation continues, they are becoming more egregious every year. Finally, the inhumane acts are committed with the purpose of maintaining the apartheid regime, and by it, maintaining permanently Israel's illegal occupation of Palestinian territory. As was shown by Mr. Reichler, the statements of Israel's highest government officials evincing Israel's determination to dislocate the Palestinian population, annex its territory, and maintain its system of colonial statement, settlement, all attest to Israel's intention to maintain an apartheid-based occupation regime permanently. In July 2014, Israel's then Minister of Justice declared, and I quote, what's so horrifying about understanding that the entire Palestinian population is the enemy? They are all enemy combatants, and their blood shall be on all their heads. They should go as should the physical homes in which they raised the snakes. Otherwise, more little snakes will be raised there." End of quote. Tragically, this is just one of the many dehumanizing descriptions by Israeli officials of Palestinian children. Snakes. Snakes, Mr. President. For all the above reasons, the State of Palestine requests the court to declare that Israel's discriminatory practices against the Palestinian people are tantamount to apartheid, which this court defined in its 1971 advisory opinion on Namibia as distinctions, exclusions, restrictions, 
and limitations exclusively based on grounds of race, color or descent or national or ethnic origin, which constitute a denial of fundamental human rights. This actually reflects the Palestinian reality. Mr. President, members of the court, 47 United Nations experts have declared that if the occupation is not brought to an end, and I quote, what would be left of the West Bank would be a Palestinian Bantustan, islands of disconnected land completely surrounded by Israel and with no territorial connection to the outside world, and would be the crystallization of an already unjust reality Two peoples living in the same space, ruled by the same state, but with profoundly unequal rights. This is a vision of a 21st century apartheid. This is apartheid. The Palestinian population in Israel stands at 20%. Hence, Israel's discriminatory treatment of Palestinians must be viewed in its totality as Palestine and other participants demonstrated in their written statements, the system of racial discrimination extends to all areas between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Furthermore, Palestine, Namibia and South Africa, together with a myriad of public figures, legal scholars, NGOs, concur that such discriminatory treatment amounts to apartheid. Even some Israeli officials admitted it. Although it might not be clear to the naked eye, by Israeli law, Jewish citizens of any country who have never been to Israel can automatically gain Israeli citizenship. Yet, Palestinian refugees who have spent their entire lives in forced exile and in refugee camps are barred forever from returning to their homelands. Unfortunately, time won't allow me to expose the full extent of Israel's discriminatory laws, but I would only highlight that Israel has an extensive set of laws discriminating against Palestinians in every aspect of life. This was not left unnoticed by CERD, which noted that the practice of segregation between Jewish and non-Jewish communities continues to be applied in Israel proper. A one-state reality of unequal rights, consolidating segregation and apartheid against Palestinians is reflected in the inherently discriminatory character of the 2018 Basic Law, Israel, the nation-state of the Jewish people. Under this law, exercising the right to national self-determination in the State of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. Developing Jewish settlements became an Israeli national value, not only in the occupied West Bank and the Syrian Golan, but even in Israel. And I ask where? On which lands? The answer is on the lands where Palestinian citizens of Israel live, especially in the Galilee and the Naqab. An exclusive right of one group and complete denial of the rights of another, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. If this is not apartheid, what is? Israel's measures, policies, and practices against the Palestinian people are no less pervasive in their reach or less pernicious in their consequences than the institutionalized racial discrimination and segregation that existed in South Africa. And just like in 1971, the international community relies on this court to play its own genuine role to bring about an end to this glaring injustice an immediate end to this illegal situation will bestow on the Palestinian people the fundamental rights to which they are entitled by international law 
yet unfortunately they have been so unjustly denied. Let me conclude, Mr. President, with a cry of desperation representing the countless victims of the ongoing Israeli atrocities as described by the Palestinian poet Murid Barghouti. In my despair, I remember there is life after death, there is life after death. And I have no problem, but I ask, oh God, oh God, is there life before death? Mr. President, members of the court, I thank you for your kind attention. Mr. President, I respectfully request that you now call Professor Sands to the podium. Thank you very much. I thank Mr. Nagam. I now invite Professor uh, Philip Sands to address the court. We have the floor, Professor. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les membres de la Cour, j'ai l'honneur de m'adresser à vous ce matin au sujet du droit du peuple palestinien à l'autodétermination, de la privation prolongée de ce droit inalignable et de sa quête permanente pour l'exercer pleinement. 53 autres États et trois organisations internationales ont déposé des observations écrites auprès de la Cour. Aucun d'entre eux, aucun, même pas Israël, n'a soutenu que le peuple palestinien n'a pas le droit à l'autodétermination en vertu du droit international. Mr. President, the written statements before you offer no discordant note to the three core propositions the State of Palestine advances in these proceedings. First, the Palestinians are a distinct people. Second, as such, they enjoy the very same rights as every other people, including that most foundational of rights, namely the right to self-determination. To decide for themselves how they will live and organize politically, socially, economically, in accordance with and subject to international law. As Professor Hirsch Lauterpacht put it in 1945, in the language of another age, Freedom means, and I quote, the right of self-government through rulers chosen by and accountable to him. And equality demands an equal opportunity of self-government and cultural development, end of quote. Third, the Palestinian people's right to self-determination has real and practical consequences. It is not an empty slogan. That right includes, but is not limited to, the right to control their own land and natural resources, the right to be free from demographic manipulations by any third party, and the right to determine their own political status, economic development, their own futures. Mr. President, members of the court, there is no dispute as to the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people. It has never been an issue, not since the time of the mandate. And this court made that clear two decades ago in its opinion in the war case, when it said loud and clear, the existence of a Palestinian people is no longer an issue. What is before this court now is the ability of the Palestinian people to exercise that right and Israel's systematic and prolonged violation of that right. What does the right to self-determination mean in practice? 
How has Israel violated it? And what are the consequences of those violations? Mr. President, members of the court, in its written statement, the State of Palestine explained that the right to self-determination comprises four specific components. First, the right to territorial integrity. Second, the right not to be subjected to demographic manipulations within that territory by a foreign power. Third, the right to exercise permanent sovereignty over its natural resources. And fourth, the right to be able to pursue its chosen economic, social and cultural development. The prolonged occupation, colonization and purported annexation by Israel of Palestinian territory with all the discriminatory and other unlawful acts have and continue to deprive the Palestinian people of each of these four distinct components. Let me start with the right to territorial integrity so recently recognized and given effect by the court in its advisory opinion on Chagos and endorsed by an overwhelming majority by the General Assembly of the United Nations. This implements resolutions 1514 and 2625. Yet Israel has clearly violated the territorial integrity of the occupied Palestinian territories through over more than half a century of belligerent occupation. As Mr. Reichler has described, it has purportedly annexed Jerusalem and the West Bank, and it has established hundreds of settlements populated by more than 700,000 settlers regarded as a permanent part of Israel. It has extended the wall that this court found to be illegal in 2004. It has confined Palestinians to enclaves. It has severed Jerusalem. It has restricted Palestinian rights of entry from the rest of the OPT. It has transformed the Gaza Strip into an impoverished enclave, a besieged, bombarded community severed from the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Its leaders have declared that Israel will be sovereign over all the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, and it has made this formal government policy. What's the consequence of this? It is the acquisition of territory by force. It is the reduction and fragmentation, as you have seen, of the territory left for the Palestinians. And this is a manifest violation of Palestine's territorial integrity, its unity, its contiguity, which are core elements of the right to self-determination. The General Assembly, the Security Council, the Human Rights Council have repeatedly called for the preservation of Palestine's territorial integrity and condemned Israel's acts as a violation of the right of the Palestinian people to exercise their self-determination. And so we urge the court to declare Israel's 56-year occupation to be unlawful, to confirm, to take the words of your recent opinion in the Chagos case, that Israel is under an obligation to bring its presence on the territory of Palestine to an end and to do so as rapidly as possible. Mr. President, members of the court, I turn to the right not to be subjected to demographic manipulation. The Palestinian people, as you've heard and are aware, have been subject to a century of dispossession and displacement in manifest violation of their right to self-determination. This is in two ways. First, the forcible displacement undermines the integrity of the people, as the court has confirmed in the Wall and Chagos opinions. Between 1947 and 1949, during the Nakba, between 750,000 and 900,000 Palestinians were forcibly displaced. In 1967, a further 400,000 were forcibly displaced. Refugees 
are prevented from being able to return. And forcible displacements continue today. Entire communities in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and now before our very eyes on a daily basis across the entirety of Gaza. Second, transferring another people into the territory of Palestine is contrary to international law. It undermines the exercise by Palestine of its right to self-determination. Yet Israel declares that hundreds of thousands of unlawful settlers will somehow remain there permanently and forever. This is a demographic manipulation of the highest order. It is grave, it continues, it violates the right of self-determination. The law requires that such actions must end forthwith. Mr. President, members of the court, the third aspect is the right to exercise permanent sovereignty over natural resources, as recognized by Article 1 of the two international covenants and by so many UN bodies. The resources include land, fresh water, agricultural and mineral resources, including hydrocarbons. Israel's control and purported annexation of the occupied Palestinian territories embraces both the land and its natural resources. For example, Israel systematically appropriates water resources. In the West Bank alone, the United Nations has documented prohibitions on Palestinians drawing waters from the River Jordan and grossly inequitable allocations of vital groundwaters as between Israelis and Palestinians. Israel pillages rock quarries. Israel prevents Palestinian exploitation of hydrocarbon deposits onshore and offshore. These two are manifest violations of the right of self-determination. Mr. President, members of the court, the fourth component of the right to self-determination is the right of a people to determine its own political status and direction and to pursue its own economic, social and cultural development of its choice. This is confirmed by a multitude of instruments and General Assembly resolutions. Yet Israel persists in prohibiting and punishing political expressions of Palestinian identity and nationhood. Flags are outlawed and attacked. Civil society organizations and political parties are declared to be unlawful. Leaders and elected representatives and civilians more generally, including so many children, are assaulted, exiled, imprisoned or killed. General Assembly resolutions and many treaties confirm that these rights exist under international law and they've been systematically violated. The economic, social and cultural rights of the Palestinian people are suppressed by a prolonged and unlawful occupation, by the purported annexation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, by the settlements, by the wall and its associated regime and infrastructure, by the blockade of Gaza, by the fragmentation of land, by the deprivation of resources, by the restrictions on freedom and movement of people and of goods, and by a multitude of other acts of subjugation and collective punishment. These acts and others have curtailed the access of the Palestinian people to livelihoods. They have made the country and the people totally dependent on aid. Cultural development, too, is under sustained assault. Access to religious and cultural sites is restricted, and the centuries-long historic status quo at Jerusalem's Christian and Muslim holy sites, notably at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, is undermined and violated. Religious, social and cultural events are stopped. Schools and universities are besieged or just demolished. Cultural heritage is usurped or just destroyed. Writers, poets, academics are simply prevented from expressing themselves and some, like the renowned poet Rafat al-Arir, have simply 
been killed. Religious leaders face intimidation, harassment, and incitement. And so too it goes for Palestinian social development. The World Bank, the World Health Organization, has described the health system in the occupied Palestinian territories as fragmented and fragile. Access to housing is destroyed by forced expulsions, demolition orders, seizure and destruction of property, discriminatory planning, violence and intimidation from settlers. In the Gaza Strip, the economic, social and cultural life of the Palestinian people has been decimated. After 17 years of blockade, the population is destitute. It is subjected to destruction on an industrial scale, now utterly dependent on humanitarian aid merely to exist. This continuing military assault today shocks the conscience of the world. Is it consistent with the right of self-determination, Mr. President? One only has to ask the question to see how it answers itself. The violence and restrictions imposed on Palestinians impact every aspect of Palestinian life. That's UNCTAD reporting in March 2003. And of course today the situation is even more grave. The violation of Palestine's exercise of the right to self-determination is manifest and it is gross. In summary, Israel has arrogated to itself the right to decide who owns Palestinian land, who may live on it, and how it is to be used. On Israel's approach, it decides on the use of resources and allocations of benefits. On Israel's approach, it decides whether Palestinians remain or return. On Israel's approach, it decides how, if at all, Palestinians may meet, trade, teach, worship, live, love. And Israel wants more. Its current Prime Minister and government celebrate the denial of Palestinian exercise of self-determination, of sovereignty and statehood. They celebrate it. They claim a right to construct settlements in the Palestinian territory. And with pride, they speak of the power to frustrate the Oslo Accords and Palestinian statehood. The ultimate expression, the ultimate expression of the right of self-determination. Mr. President, let us be blunt. Israel has sought to negate the rights of the Palestinian people to exercise their right of self-determination in all aspects across all parts of the territory of mandatory Palestine. It has done so for decades and it wishes to do so forever. Tragically, tragically, Israel celebrates the manifest violation of international law inherent in its prolonged occupation. Tragically, tragically, Israel asserts the right of national self-determination in the State of Israel, and I'm quoting, is unique to the Jewish people under its own 2018 basic law. Tragically, tragically, Israel sets its face against the role of international law. No one in this great hall of justice is starry-eyed about international law. But it is what we have, and it is your role as judges of this court, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, to affirm the place and the power of international law, to confirm the illegality of the occupation, to make clear that Palestine in all respects meets the criteria of statehood under international law with all the rights and responsibilities that implies. Mr. President, members of the court, the existence and exercise of the right to self-determination are not conditional. 
The right is a peremptory right. This is recognised by states, by judges of this court, by the International Law Commission, by commentators. And what that means in practice is that there is no derogation from the existence or exercise of the right. In Chagos, the court confirmed that Resolution 1514, which recognises self-determination, must be exercised without any conditions or reservations, reflects customary general international law. The only limitation on the right, the court has said, is that the free and genuine expression of the people concerned has to be exercised in accordance with international law. In Chagos, this court swatted away British and American arguments that alleged security concerns somehow trumped the right of self-determination and it's exercised. And we trust that the court will dismiss the argument that somehow the Palestinian people's right of self-determination is conditional upon a subjective determination by another state as to matters of its security. This right to self-determination includes the right of a people to form a sovereign and independent state. More than 140 states have recognised Palestine as a state, with a population, with a defined territory, with a government, being a party to multiple treaty, a state with rights and with obligations. Mr President, members of the court, Palestinian statehood is not dependent on the approval of Israel. An occupying power does not have and cannot have a right of veto over the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people. The inalienable rights of the Palestinian people include the right of self-determination, national independence and sovereignty. What are the consequences of Israel's violations of Palestine's right to self-determination and its exercise? Professor Pelle is going to address these matters so I can be brief. As the purpose and effect of the occupation is the denial of the right of self-determination and the prevention, let's be frank, of the solution called for by the Security Council, the General Assembly and the vast majority of states of our world, premised on the existence of the two-state solution, the occupation is illegal and must be brought to an immediate, unconditional and total end. The right of self-determination requires that UN member states bring Israel's occupation to an immediate end. No aid, no assistance, no complicity, no contribution to forcible actions, no money, no arms, no trade, no nothing. All UN members are obliged by law to end Israel's presence on the territory of Palestine, period. In concluding, Mr. President, members of the court, may I respond to the unfortunate point made by a small number of states that an opinion from this court would somehow negatively impact future negotiations. With great respect, the truth is the very opposite. First, the court has confirmed already the Palestinian people have a right to self-determination without derogation. The existence and exercise of the right to self-determination is not and can never be a matter for negotiation. Second, the function of this court, of these judges, of you, is to state the law, to spell out the legal rights and obligations that will allow a just solution in the future in conformity with international law. The political context is totally irrelevant. The legal questions in Namibia, in the Wall case, in the Chagos case, all had a political context. But the court did not blink. It has never shied away from drawing the consequences of the right to self-determination. In Chagos and in Namibia, 
the advisory opinions have been significant and positive in their outcomes and effects. By identifying the applicable legal principles and then applying them to the facts, the court performs a most significant, uniquely significant role for protagonists and for the international community as a whole. With great respect to my friends from the United States and Britain, it is the very opposite of what they have written. The function of this court in interpreting and applying the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people can only assist in a solution based on the law by setting out the parameters required by the law to resolve the matter. A forthright advisory opinion from this court makes a resolution more likely, not less likely. Mr. President, in 1945, Professor Hirsch Lauterpacht wrote that self-determination is an enlightened and beneficent ideal to which the formation of states must conform if both justice and the peace of the world are to be secured. That is the beating heart of self-determination. The idea that a people must be able to determine for themselves their lives and their futures. And Hirsch Lauterpacht personally knew of what he spoke. And we know that he was right. Israel's actions, as you have heard already today and will hear in the coming days, are manifest, grave and continuing violations of the right of which Lauterpacht spoke. And we invite this court to so declare, to help bring to an end this affront, to allow the Palestinian people to determine the conditions under which they will live in their territory, under their government, under the law, and to do so fully and to do so forthwith. That's what international law requires, no more and no less. Mr. President, I thank you for your kind attention and I invite you to call Professor Pelle to the bar. I thank Professor Sands. I now invite Professor Pelle to address the court. Vous avez la parole, Monsieur le Professeur. I will. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les Juges, mes collègues ont résumé dans le temps limité qui leur était imparti les principaux faits internationalement illicites qui sont attribuables à Israël. Ils ont été plus longuement et précisément décrits, non seulement dans les observations écrites de l'État de Palestine, mais aussi dans celles de la très grande majorité des 56 autres États et organisations internationales qui ont pris part à la procédure écrite. Il m'appartient de récapituler tout aussi brièvement, non pas ces graves violations elles-mêmes, mais les conséquences juridiques qui en découlent. Ces conséquences sont l'objet même des deux questions posées à la Cour par l'Assemblée Générale, puisque l'une et l'autre portent sur les conséquences juridiques, justement, de l'occupation prolongée des territoires palestiniens. Même si je me bornais à commander, la seule, à commander la seule liste des diverses conséquences découlant des faits internationalement illicites dont Israël est responsable, je dépasserais considérablement le temps dont je dispose. Aussi me permettrais-je, mesdames et messieurs de la Cour, de vous renvoyer au passage de nos observations écrites et de celles de la plupart des États et organisations internationales participant à la procédure, qui énumèrent ces conséquences de manière particulièrement soigneuse et pertinente. Les références seront reproduites par les soins diligents du greffe dans les comptes rendus de cette audience et figurent également dans le tableau synthétique figurant à l'onglet « synthétique mais long » figurant à l'anglais 6.1 de vos dossiers, dont je redirai quelques mots dans un instant. Ces énumérations appellent plusieurs remarques générales et préalables. En premier lieu, 
Comme l'ont souligné les participants à la procédure écrite sur ce point unanime, les conséquences juridiques résultant pour Israël de ces violations des règles applicables sont au premier chef celles codifiées par les articles 29 à 37 du projet de la CDI de 2001 sur la, les, la responsabilité de l'État. Il s'agit bien sûr de la réparation intégrale des dommages causés par les actions ou omissions d'Israël, mais aussi de leur cessation, inséparable du devoir d'exécuter les obligations violées, et de l'obligation d'offrir des garanties de non-répétition. Un autre point, sur lequel il existe aussi un très large consensus, tient à la nature des obligations violées. D'une manière générale, les participants à la procédure considèrent qu'il s'agit de violations graves par Israël, d'obligations découlant de normes impératives du droit international général dont la définition et les conséquences sont partiellement codifiées par les articles 40 et 41 des articles de la CDI. Et tel est principalement le cas de l'interdiction de, de, de l'acquisition de territoire par la menace ou l'usage de la force, de l'obligation de respecter le droit à l'autodétermination, de nombreuses règles relevant du droit humanitaire ou protectrice des droits humains, et en particulier de l'interdiction de la discrimination raciale et de l'apartheid. Je note au passage que cette énumération recoupe de façon frappante la liste non exhaustive de normes que la Commission du droit international avait précédemment désignées comme ayant ce statut de normes impératives et qu'elle a annexé à ses projets de conclusion sur les normes impératives du droit international général jusqu'à Jeans. Mais comme elles l'aigle l'ont amplement montré, je n'y reviens que pour souligner les conséquences particulières qui s'attachent à la nature propre des normes impératives. Je précise cependant que ces principes impératifs présentés dans le tableau projeté à l'écran sont davantage dé détaillés et précisés dans le document reproduit à l'onglet 6.2 du dossier des juges. La raison pour laquelle il est utile de singulariser ces obligations tient à leurs conséquences particulières. Premièrement, et c'est le point de départ, s'agissant de normes impératives, elles s'imposent à leurs destinataires indépendamment de leur consentement. Deuxièmement, Contrairement à ce que voudraient faire croire quelques États, on ne saurait les interpréter comme, dé... comme dérogeant ni aux règles de Juscoguins, ni à la charte des Nations Unies, qui constitue la norme suprême créant aussi bien le Conseil de sécurité que la Cour, et par laquelle ces deux organes sont bien sûr tous deux liés. En outre, aucune circonstance ne saurait exclure l'illicéité d'un fait quelconque d'un État non conforme à une obligation découlant d'une norme impérative du droit international général. Ce principe est codifié par l'important article 26 des articles de la CDI de 2001 et il est rappelé par le non moins important projet de conclusion 18 des projets de la CDI sur les normes impératives du droit international général. Enfin, Israël ne saurait s'abriter derrière les pré de prétendues circonstances excluant l'illicéité pour justifier la violation de ses obligations impératives, péremptoires, intransgressibles. J'ajoute que ces considérations s'imposent également mutatis mutandis en ce qui concerne les obligations qui résultent de résolution du Conseil de sécurité et d'abord, bien sûr, des décisions prises en vertu du chapitre 7 de la charte dont la liste pertinente figure à l'onglet 6.3 de vos dossiers. En aucun cas, des négociations ne peuvent remettre en cause les normes de Juscoguins dont l'une des principales euh, conséquences consiste, c'est bien connu, à annihiler tout traité qui, au moment de sa conclusion, est en conflit avec une norme impérative du droit international général. 
L'aboutissement des négociations ne saurait être contraire aux normes impératives que j'ai énumérées il y a quelques instants, non plus d'ailleurs qu'aux résolutions obligatoires du Conseil de sécurité, mais celles-ci, en règle générale, reprennent ces normes impératives et les appliquent au contexte propre, euh, propre à leur objet. Monsieur le Président, contrairement à ce que les États-Unis ont laissé entendre dans leurs observations écrites, la tenue de négociation n'est pas nécessaire pour que soient tirées les conséquences qui s'imposent des violations par Israël de ses obligations internationales. Dès lors que euh, l'attribution des violations est établie, et en l'occurrence elle n'est ni contestable ni en réalité contestée, dès lors donc que l'attribution est établie, la responsabilité de l'auteur existe ipso facto avec toute conséquence de droit. Pour le nier, quelques États ont invoqué notamment une phrase citée hors contexte, tirée de votre avis de euh, 2004 dans l'affaire du mur. Et je cite cette phrase. « Seule la mise en œuvre de bonne foi de toutes les résolutions pertinentes du Conseil de sécurité, en particulier les résolutions 242-1967 et 338-1973, est susceptible de mettre fin à une, de mettre un terme à cette situation tragique. Mais tout ce que vous avez dit dans ce, par cette phrase, c'est que l'État de Palestine, qui y est prêt, et Israël, qui semble loin d'y être disposé, doivent appliquer les résolutions du Conseil de sécurité. Ils le doivent en effet à la fois durant et indépendamment d'éventuelles négociations. Et dans la vie sur le mur, justement, vous n'avez nullement considéré que le prétendu cadre de négociation vous empêchait de vous prononcer sur les conséquences juridiques de son édification illicite. J'ajoute que ni la résolution 242, ni la résolution 338 ne portent directement sur la responsabilité d'Israël pour ses pratiques et politiques à l'encontre du peuple palestinien. En revanche, la seconde, la, la 338, appelle, je cite, à des négociations entre les parties en cause sous les auspices appropriés en vue d'instaurer une paix juste et durable au Moyen-Orient. Ce n'est pas un problème de responsabilité. Et cette question reste plus que jamais d'actualité. Vous avez d'ailleurs, toujours dans la vie du, sur le mur, appelé l'attention de l'Assemblée Générale sur la nécessité d'encourager, c'est une citation, d'encourager les efforts en vue d'aboutir le plus tôt possible sur la base du droit international, sur la base du droit international, à une solution négociée des problèmes pendants et à la constitution d'un État palestinien vivant côte à côte avec Israël et ses autres voisins et d'assurer à chacun, à chacun, dans la région, paix et sécurité. J'insiste sur la base du droit international. On the basis of international law. Autre conséquence du caractère impératif des normes violées par Israël, celui-ci ne saurait invoquer aucune circonstance pour s'exonérer de sa responsabilité, que ce soit au motif d'un consentement prétendument donné par l'État de Palestine, ou en invoquant la légitime défense, ou en invoquant l'État de nécessité. Israël ne pourrait pas davantage justifier de contre-mesures en riposte à un fait internationalement illicite qu'il imputerait à la Palestine. Comme la CDI le note à juste titre dans le commentaire de l'article 26 des articles sur la responsabilité de l'État, et je cite, « Il n'est pas permis à un État, prenant des contre-mesures, de déroger à une telle norme, et l'État de nécessité ne peut excuser la violation d'une norme impérative. » L'État de Palestine ne nie pas 
que pour mettre en œuvre concrètement les obligations découlant de la responsabilité d'Israël à son égard et vis-à-vis -vis du peuple palestinien, des négociations pourraient être utiles, voire nécessaires. Mais s'agissant d'obligations découlant de normes impératives, ce ne pourrait être que pour faire face à des nécessités pratiques et en aucune manière de telles négociations ou leurs perspectives ne pourraient être un prétexte à, permettant à Israël de s'exonérer de sa responsabilité, d'en imboindrir les conséquences ou d'en retarder la mise en œuvre. Je vous prie de m'excuser. Wow. Mesdames et Messieurs de la Cour, comme l'ont souligné non seulement l'État de Palestine, mais aussi un grand nombre d'autres participants à la procédure écrite, les obligations qui incombent à Israël de tirer les conséquences juridiques des faits internationalement illicites dont il est responsable sont inconditionnel et d'effet immédiat. Tel est le cas s'agissant de l'obligation de mettre fin immédiatement et inconditionnellement et complètement à l'occupation du territoire palestinien, y compris Jérusalem-Est, occupation maintenue depuis euh, près de, durant près de cinq... Euh, oui, un petit, euh, a little bit more, yes. Ok. <rire> Et de l'obligation de mettre fin, je disais, immédiatement et conditionnellement et complètement à l'occupation du territoire palestinien, y compris Jérusalem-Est, occupation maintenue de, euh, durant près de 57 ans, en violation notamment de l'interdiction de l'acquisition de territoires par la menace ou le recours à la force, en violation du droit à l'autodétermination du peuple palestinien, en violation de la prohibition de la, de la discrimination raciale et de l'apartheid et des principes fondamentaux protecteurs des droits de la personne humaine et du droit humanitaire. C'est aussi le cas de l'obligation de mettre à néant l'ensemble des textes législatifs ou réglementaires visant à annexer Jérusalem-Est ou une partie, quelle qu'elle soit, du territoire de l'État de Palestine au mépris de son intégrité territoriale, ainsi que ceux organisant l'exploitation de ses ressources naturelles. C'est le cas de l'obligation d'en finir avec la politique d'apartheid et de discrimination raciale dont le peuple palestinien est victime dans son ensemble, tant dans les territoires occupés qu'en Israël. C'est le cas de l'obligation de révoquer toutes les mesures visant à modifier la composition démographique des territoires occupés, y compris Jérusalem, et le statut des lieux saints et dans le même esprit de l'interdiction d'établir les missions des missions diplomatiques à Jérusalem. Il en va aussi, aussi de l'obligation de démanteler les colonies de peuplement dans les territoires occupés, ou de l'obligation d'assurer le retour des Palestiniens expulsés d'Israël et du territoire palestinien occupé et de leurs descendants, et de restituer les propriétés confisquées, qu'il s'agisse de biens immobiliers ou mobiliers, à leurs propriétaires palestiniens et de leur assurer une indemnisation appropriée. Ou encore de l'obligation de rechercher, de poursuivre et de punir les auteurs de crimes de guerre, de crimes contre l'humanité, dont l'apartheid, ou de génocide ou d'autres violations graves des, des droits de la personne humaine. Je me permets de vous renvoyer à nouveau, mesdames et messieurs les juges, au tableau qui figure à l'onglet 6.1 de vos dossiers et qui synthétise, à partir des réponses tant de l'État de Palestine que de plusieurs autres participants à la procédure, les conséquences juridiques sur lesquelles vous êtes appelés à vous prononcer. Monsieur le Président, les obligations secondaires, si on veut, que j'ai énumérées jusqu'à présent, 
sont la conséquence des pratiques et politiques d'Israël menées en violation grave et persistante d'obligations découlantes de normes impératives du droit international général et d'abord de son occupation illicite et de la négation du droit du peuple palestinien à l'autodétermination qui sont la source de tous les autres maux. En s'acquittant effectivement et rapidement de ses obligations, Israël procéderait en partie au moins au rétablissement de la situation qui existait avant que euh, le fait illicite ne soit commis, sans que cela suffise néanmoins à réparer les immenses préjudices causés au peuple palestinien depuis la Nakba de 1948. Dans la mesure où ce dommage ne peut être réparé par la restitution, Israël doit s'acquitter de deux autres obligations. Conformément au principe codifié par les articles 34, 36 et 37 des articles de 2001, il est tenu de procéder à l'indemnisation des victimes de ces agissements et de donner satisfaction en réparation du préjudice causé par ces faits internationalement illicites sous forme de reconnaissance des violations, d'expression de regrets, d'excuses formelles ou selon toute autre modalité appropriée. Je ne m'étendrai pas sur l'indemnisation, sauf à rappeler que la réparation doit être intégrale et qu'elle est essentielle pour les Palestiniens, victimes directes des exactions israéliennes, notamment du fait du non-respect des droits humains et du droit humanitaire, et en particulier de la, je cite, « Convention de Genève relative à la protection des personnes civiles en temps de guerre du 12 août 1949, applicable à tous les territoires arabes occupés par Israël depuis 1976. » C'est la résolution 484-1980 du Conseil de sécurité. Mais dans le cadre de la présente procédure, vous ne pouvez guère, mesdames et messieurs les juges, composer le principe sans déterminer les montants des indemnisations. En revanche, vous pouvez vous montrer plus précis en ce qui concerne la satisfaction que l'État de Palestine est en droit d'attendre de la part d'Israël. Notamment parce que le Conseil de sécurité et l'Assemblée générale ont fait des constatations expresses et juridiquement obligatoires à cet égard. Dans cet esprit, le Conseil de sécurité a évoqué dès 1967, je cite, « la reconnaissance de la souveraineté, de l'intégrité territoriale et de l'indépendance politique de chaque, chaque État de la région ». Cet appel lancé à Israël est resté sans effet, mais aurait dû et devrait plus que jamais inciter les États qui ne l'ont pas fait à suivre l'exemple des 145 pays qui ont déjà reconnu l'État de Palestine. Dans cette même résolution, le Conseil appelle, je cite à nouveau, à garantir l'inviolabilité territoriale et l'indépendance politique de chaque État de la région. Chaque État, cela comprend désormais indiscutablement l'État de Palestine. Ces décisions, car il s'agit de décisions obligatoires, ont été réitérées à maintes reprises depuis lors, notamment par l'importante résolution 2334 du Conseil de sécurité du 23 décembre 2016, qui présente un intérêt tout particulier et que nous avons fait figurer pour votre commodité dans l'anglais 6.4 du dossier des juges. Israël n'y a pas davantage prêté attention. Monsieur le Président, s'il existe une situation dans laquelle les assurances et garanties de non-répétition envisagées par l'article 30 des articles de la CDI s'imposent, c'est bien celle qui nous occupe. Depuis presque 57 ans, malgré les appels répétés de l'Assemblée générale et du Conseil de sécurité des Nations unies et de nombreuses autres organisations internationales, gouvernementales ou non, Israël s'en est obstinément tenu à sa politique d'oppression et de discrimination contre le peuple palestinien au mépris des principes les plus fondamentaux du droit international 
et a, par ses pratiques, continuellement aggravé la situation avec l'objectif non dissimulé de rendre impossible la réalisation du droit du peuple à palestinien à l'autodétermination. Je relève des, du reste, une fois de plus, que le Conseil de sécurité a de longue date appelé expressément Israël à s'acquitter de l'ensemble de ses obligations, comme le montre le tableau qui figure à l'onglet 6.3 de vos dossiers, qui synthétise l'ensemble des résolutions pertinentes du Conseil de sécurité. Et l'Assemblée générale a insisté à maintes reprises sur la, je cite, « nécessité impérieuse, impérieuse » de mettre un terme immédiatement à l'occupation israélienne qui a commencé en 1967. Fin de citation. Ainsi qu'aux autres manquements d'Israël à ses obligations dont l'Assemblée a souligné le caractère impératif. Immédiatement. Monsieur le Président, outre l'impossibilité juridique pour la Palestine de renoncer à exiger d'Israël le respect de ses obligations impératives, le caractère coguince de celles-ci et la gravité de leur violation par Israël ont d'importantes conséquences vis-à-vis -vis des États tiers. Elles sont énumérées à minima à l'article 41 des articles de la CDI. Le Conseil de sécurité et l'Assemblée générale ont de façon récurrente appelé tous les États à ne fournir à Israël aucune assistance qui serait utilisée spécifiquement pour les colonies de peuplement des territoires occupés. Plus largement, ils ont également réaffirmé l'obligation des Nations unies et de tous les États de ne pas reconnaître la situation résultant de l'occupation illicite du territoire palestinien, de ne pas lui apporter aide ou assistance, de faire la distinction entre le territoire palestinien occupé et celui d'Israël, et de respecter et de faire respecter le droit international. Cela implique que la responsabilité d'Israël soit mise en œuvre et que des moyens pratiques soient adoptés pour assurer l'application des résolutions du Conseil de sécurité. Excusez-moi. Monsieur le Président, les principes énoncés à l'article 41 décrivent certaines des conséquences indispensables, essentielles, de toute violation grave d'obligations découlant de normes impératives du droit international. De telles normes sont rares, certes, mais Israël a gravement et systématiquement violé la plupart d'entre elles et persiste à les violer. Il doit en assumer les conséquences et il appartient à la Cour de les lui rappeler et d'en préciser le contenu au regard des faits de l'espèce. Ici encore, par manque de temps et parce que « iterare et adem omnia diabolicum », je vous prie de bien vouloir vous reporter au paragraphe pertinent de nos observations et nos commentaires écrits. Je me borne à rappeler en style télégraphique que les États et les organisations internationales, à commencer par les Nations Unies, doivent s'interdire de fournir à Israël une aide militaire et technologique susceptible d'être utilisée dans le territoire palestinien occupé, y compris à Gaza bien sûr pour perpétuer ou accentuer son occupation et le régime de discrimination raciale et d'apartheid qu'Israël a institué. Cette interdiction s'étend à l'autorisation de toute forme de commerce d'armes pouvant servir à de telles fins. Les États tiers doivent aussi assister le peuple palestinien, y compris les réfugiés depuis la Nakba jusqu'à ceux qui ont fui les exactions israéliennes récentes, en leur fournissant les moyens nécessaires à leur subsistance, notamment par le biais des organisations internationales compétentes, et cela inclut sûrement l'UNRWA. 
Ils doivent aussi s'abstenir de nouer des relations économiques ou toute autre forme de rapport avec Israël, impliquant la population ou les ressources naturelles des, des territoires occupés, sans l'accord express des représentants légitimes du peuple palestinien. Les États tiers doivent aussi s'assurer que leurs nationaux ne pillent pas et ne s'approprient pas les, euh, indûment ces ressources. Tous les États ont l'obligation de coopérer, et organisations internationales ont l'obligation de coopérer en vue de la réalisation effective du droit du peuple palestinien à l'autodétermination. Ils doivent aussi poursuivre et punir l'ensemble des individus responsables de crimes graves de droit international, y compris leurs propres nationaux, devant leur juridiction nationale ou en coopérant avec la Cour pénale internationale. Il y a en effet un point sur lequel je souhaite attirer plus spécialement votre attention, mesdames et messieurs les juges. Il relève du paragraphe 3 de l'article 41 qui précise être sans préjudice des autres conséquences prévues dans la présente partie et de toute conséquence supplémentaire que peut entraîner, d'après le droit international, une violation grave telle que l'a défini l'article 40. Dès lors, les obligations des États tiers et des Nations unies ne s'arrêtent pas à ces devoirs de coopération et de reconnaissance. Comme l'État de Palestine l'a expliqué dans ses observations écrites, ils ont également une obligation à la fois coutumière et conventionnelle de rechercher et de punir ou extrader les auteurs des violations, qu'il s'agisse de crimes de guerre, de crimes contre l'humanité ou du crime d'apartheid, pour ne rien dire des actes de génocide commis contre le peuple palestinien, dont vous avez reconnu la plausibilité dans votre ordonnance du 26 janvier dernier. Vous avez d'ailleurs euh, euh, expressément rappelé dans votre avis sur le mur que, je cite, « Tous les États partis à la Convention de Genève relative à la protection des personnes civiles en temps de guerre ont l'obligation, dans le respect de la Charte des Nations Unies et du droit international, de faire respecter par Israël le droit international humanitaire incorporé dans cette Convention. » Cette obligation s'étend à l'ensemble des crimes commis par ou à l'instigation d'Israël. Mesdames et messieurs les juges, je pense qu'aucune affaire qui vous a été soumise, contentieuse ou consultative, n'a soulevé autant de questions et des questions gravissimes que celles sur lesquelles vous êtes appelé à vous prononcer aujourd'hui. Le nombre de participants à cette procédure, 57 durant la phase écrite, 54 qui prennent part à ces audiences, témoigne de l'importance et de l'enjeu, euh, et, et de l'importance de l'enjeu et de la conviction de la communauté internationale des États dans son ensemble, que la Cour a un rôle crucial à jouer pour aider à mettre fin à la situation dramatique créée par les manquements d'Israël aux principes les plus intransgressibles du droit international. Comme un très grand nombre d'États et d'organisations internationales, la Palestine a détaillé dans ses observations écrites les conséquences des très nombreuses et graves violations du droit international commises par Israël, y compris de la plupart de ses règles les plus fondamentales. Elle considère qu'il vous appartient d'idée l'action de l'Assemblée Générale et au-delà des Nations Unies et de l'ensemble des États pour s'assurer qu'Israël se conforme enfin aux obligations qui découlent pour lui de ces manquements répétés, systématiques et continus aux principes les plus fondamentaux du droit international. Et il faut redire que tous ces principes, toutes ces violations, sont engendrés par l'occupation prolongée du territoire palestinien qui est sans aucun doute la mère de toutes ces violations. Votre avis, mesdames et messieurs de la Cour, sera un guide précieux pour cela. L'État de Palestine est conscient que vous ne pourrez d'un coup de baguette magique mettre fin à l'occupation israélienne et à la situation tragique du peuple palestinien.
Mais il a la certitude qu'en qu énonçant avec fermeté et précision les conséquences juridiques de la violation persistante par Israël des droits du peuple palestinien, vous pouvez, par votre avis, contribuer de manière appréciable à faire cesser cette terrible injustice et à œuvrer, et c'est une citation, à œuvrer pour une paix juste et durable, permettant à chaque État de la région de vivre en sécurité, fin de citation, conformément à l'injonction du Conseil de sécurité, vieille maintenant de 57 ans. Du même coup, vous vous acquitterez de votre fonction première, assurer le respect du droit international dont votre cours, mesdames et messieurs les juges, est l'organe. Je vous remercie de votre attention et je vous prie, Monsieur le Président, de bien vouloir appeler à la barre Monsieur le Ministre Mansour Riyad, représentant permanent de la Palestine auprès des Nations Unies, pour quelques remarques conclusives. Je remercie le Professeur Pelé. I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Riyad Mansour. You have the floor, Excellency. Mr. President. Honorable members of the court, I think you have in your folders the full text or the original text of my speech, but I tried in light of uh, the lateness of the hour, I shortened it further. As we gather here in this great hall of justice, in the Peace Palace, we are reminded of these simple words. Peace through justice, peace through law. The General Assembly brought the question of Palestine before the court because our people, the law and peace are in jeopardy. The clarity of the law as it pertains to this question is only matched by the evidence of its continued breach by Israel As we address you today, this breach has reached its most inhumane levels. More than two million Palestinians in Gaza are being pushed all the way to the border, to the very brink. Palestinian children, women and men, consumed by disease, despair, destruction and death which are spreading like wildfire. In the rest of occupied Palestine, settlers rampage and terrorize. No village, town or city, no community, no sanctity spared. Israeli leaders no longer feel the need to hide their intentions. They speak openly of getting rid of the Palestinian people one way or another. They defy the law, and the law is barely fighting back. For Palestine, the law continues to be only a measure of the severity of breaches, rather than a catalyst for action and accountability. What does international law mean for Palestinian children in Gaza today? It has protected neither them nor their childhood. It has not protected their families or communities. It has not protected their lives or limbs, their hopes or homes. We are a proud and resilient people that has endured more than its share of agony. It is so painful to be Palestinian today. How could we be just subjected to such loss and injustice, such lawlessness and humiliation time and time again? What does international law mean for a nation bestowed with inherent rights but enjoying none? It took 75 years 
for the UN to commemorate the Nakba, our violent disposition, displacement from our land, and denial of our rights and existence. And we are seeing it happen all over again. Massacres, millions forcibly driven towards the unknown, tents, starvation, deprivation, and dehumanization enabling one people to impose all of this on another. Palestinians under occupation in Israel as refugees and in the diaspora, all they ask for are their rights and to live in freedom and dignity in their ancestral land. For 75 years, the Palestinian people have faced attempts to push them out of geography and indeed out of history. And it goes on, and it will go on forever, unless and until international law is upheld, unless and until the unlawful occupation of Palestine ends. Mr. President, members of the court, our right to self-determination was recognized in the context of a mandate 100 years ago, yet simultaneously negated by the actions of the mandatory power. The question of Palestine was passed on to the United Nations at the time of its inception and has remained on its agenda ever since. In the aftermath of the Nakba, the United Nations admitted Israel to membership while emphasizing the need for it to respect Resolution 181 and 194 concerning the Palestinian state and the territory allotted to it, the international status of Jerusalem, and the right of return of Palestine refugees. Israel recognized these resolutions to secure its admission only to renege on them as soon as it was admitted. Ever since Israel became convinced that the new realities imposed by the use of force would override the obligations arising from the rule of international law without any consequences. In 1967, the Security Council emphasized the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war and called for the withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. Instead, Israel started to colonize the land. The General Assembly in Resolution 3005 called upon Israel to, to desist the annexation of any part of the occupied territories and the establishment of Israeli settlements on those territories and the transfer of parts of an alien population into the occupied territories. Instead, Israel formalized its annexation of Jerusalem and other parts of the West Bank and poured hundreds of thousands of settlers into our territory. In 1974, 50 years ago, the General Assembly reaffirmed the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people in Palestine, including the right to self-determination without external interference, the right to national independence and sovereignty, as well as the inalienable right of the Palestinians to return to their homes and property from which they have been displaced and uprooted and called for their return. Instead, Israel denied the existence of the Palestinian people. The United Nations has consistently reiterated these calls, yet Israel has consistently rejected them, entrenching its violations rather than ending them. So here we are. Though the law is absolutely clear, it is being trampled. Without accountability, there is no justice, and without justice, there can be no peace. Israel must be made 
to bear the consequences of its illegal conduct rather than reap the benefits. After 75 years, justice can no longer wait for the day Israel has an epiphany and suddenly decides to reverse course and commit to the law and UN resolutions. Our journey in the search of, for justice has brought us before you, before the International Court of Justice, following the General Assembly's decision to seek your guidance. We call on you to confirm that Israelis' presence in the occupied Palestinian territory is illegal. I repeat, it is illegal that the presence of its occupation forces and settlers is illegal and that, that its occupation must thus come to an immediate, complete and unconditional end. I repeat, an immediate, complete and unconditional end. This occupation has served as cover for Israelis' colonial designs the acquisition of Palestinian territory by force. In 1980, the Security Council reaffirmed the overriding necessity to end the prolonged occupation of Arab territories occupied by Israel since 1967, including Jerusalem. If the occupation was deemed prolonged in 1980, how should it be characterized today nearly 45 years later. I repeat, if the occupation was deemed prolonged in 1980, how should it be characterized today, nearly 45 years later? And if it was an overriding necessity to end it then, what exactly is it now, I ask you? Mr. President, members of the court, the United Nations admitted Israel in 1949. 75 years later, Palestine is yet to be admitted as full member of the United Nations. I sat in the General Assembly next to representatives of liberation movements, next to the ANC and SWABO. We stood side by side with them as they achieved their independence and, the, and took their rightful places among the community of nations. They cannot accept that the Palestinian people are left behind any longer. Indefinitely denied their innate rights. That is why many of those states will appear before this court in the coming days. Mr. President, members of the court, based on the UN record, you should have no difficulty arriving at the conclusion that the occupation is prolonged, that Palestinian territory has been annexed, that our self-determination has been denied, and that the people of Palestine have been subjected to systematic racial discrimination. The occupation itself cannot be distinguished from these breaches. They are not merely the result of the occupation, but are rather the foundation upon which the occupation rests. Rooted in the singular unlawful goal of maintaining permanent Israeli dominant over the occupied Palestinian territory and relegating the Palestinians it has not been able to displace to inferior status in their own land, in perpetuity deprived of their inalienable rights. A finding from this distinguished court that the occupation is illegal and drawing the legal consequences from this determination would contribute to bringing it to an immediate end, paving the way to just and lasting peace. 
In, in, in closing, honorable, honorable judges, the state of Palestine appeals to this court to guide the international community in upholding international law, ending injustice, and achieving a just and lasting peace, to guide us towards a future in which Palestinian children are treated as children. <sighs> Not as demographic threat in which the identity of the group to which we belong does not diminish the human rights to which we are all entitled. A future in which no Palestinian and no Israelis is killed. A future in which two states live side by side in peace and security. The Palestinian only, people only demand respect for their rights. They ask for nothing more. They cannot accept nothing less and nothing else. The future of freedom, justice, and peace can begin here and now. It is within your power to give the clearest statement possible on what the law is what it requires and what it means in practice for all members of the United Nations. We trust in your wisdom, your fairness, and your dedication to justice and the rule of law. And I thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Mansour. This concludes the oral statement of the State of Palestine your statement brings to an end this morning's session. The court will meet again tomorrow at 10 a.m. to hear South Africa, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Bangladesh, and Belgium. The sitting is adjourned.